Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, welcome back uh, to this uh, course on uh, combustion in uh, ear breathing aero engines. Now uh, last class you have seen that uh, uh, you have seen uh, details of chemical kinetics from a generalized viewpoint. We introduced the, the concepts of a generalized reaction, then we introduced uh, law of mass action and then we introduce the reaction rate constant or the reaction rate coefficient and uh, the concepts of activation energies uh, uh, etc. And then uh, uh, we uh, discussed how we can describe uh, explosion that is uh, fast reactions uh, uh, which, release, which leads to rapid uh, release of energy uh, due to the chain branching steps. Okay. Uh, chain branching which is uh, an essential uh, reaction that is uh, involving the chain carriers. So, this we have seen, but that was as you have seen that that was basically and of course, we have also looked into the different uh, theories of reaction rates uh, the namely the collision rate theory and the transition state theory, uh, but as you have seen that this was done for generalized reaction and uh, we did not discuss specific reactions uh, that is specific to uh, uh, combustion in uh, air breathing engines as such, but that uh, so what we will do in this class is that we will use that generalized framework that was introduced in last class and here in this class we will look into specific reactions that are of interest in an uh, in an actual practical combustor. Okay. So, that is uh, what we will do here. Uh, so, what we will do is that uh, as you see here we will talk about the reactions involving uh, hydrogen carbon monoxide methane and uh, not only because these are important fuels, but these are these if we are the idea is that if you understand the reaction mechanism of these, the reaction mechanisms through which the hydrogen combusts or hydrogen oxidizes uh, in presence of oxidizer, how carbon monoxide oxidizes, how methane oxidizes. These reaction mechanism form integral parts of uh, reaction mechanisms of complex fuels that are used in actual air breathing engines. Right. So, that is the idea and then we will look into pollutant chemistry. Uh, of course, uh, when you design a combustor you have to ensure two things basically that number one it should be producing the required amount of power that it should burn the fuel air mixture that you are sending in okay, and it should burn cleanly, it should not produce too much of NOx and too much of soot. So, soot and NOx are two major polluting major pollutants that are result of hydrocarbon combustion and we will try to understand the, the reaction uh, mechanisms of uh, the formation of those uh, pollutants. And then uh, we will go into uh, mechanism, uh, we will go into mechanism development. Okay. Um, so, uh, mechanism development and also mechanism reduction that is uh, we will often see that uh, um, we will often see that uh, the uh, reaction uh, mechanisms that are of interest uh, that is uh, for example, involving uh, combustion of larger hydrocarbons those are often uh, uh, th those are often involve too many species and too many reactions. Okay. And uh, as a result of that, it uh, often becomes prohibitively expensive for their use in a given CFD code. Okay. Suppose you want to do the uh, uh, comp computational fluid dynamics simulation of an actual combustor. Okay. So, then you would want these realistic mechanisms, but then these re realistic mechanisms are so large that you, you cannot use it for a practical uh, uh, simulation. So, what you need to do is that you need to reduce its size make them compact. So, the number of species and number of reactions used are of uh, are tractable the numbers are less. So, that we can uh, do the simulation with required amount of uh, computational power 
uh, and um, of course, it compromises on the accuracy, but we have to ensure that we desire some kind of properties and desire some kind of accuracies, so that those are um, uh, compromises at a minimum level. Okay. So, uh, we need to understand mechanisms, the oxidation mechanism of fuels uh, basically to uh, basically without that we do not, we have no idea about how the products are being formed and as a result of which even which products will be formed and what we can do, how we can engineer so that we can desire, we can make sure certain properties are, certain desired properties are maintained inside the combustor. For example, you can have always a flame stabilized inside the combustor whereas certain undesired properties like pollutants and uh, emissions those are mitigated. Okay. So, uh, first uh, uh, the thing is that, um, so uh, uh, before we go into the details of the oxidation mechanisms, what we will study here is that we will go into the practical fuels just to as a, as a reminder of what the practical fuels are, what those names are, what their nomenclature is and how their structures look like. Now, uh, first of all you will see that in most of these practical fuels the this becomes the CH2 and of course, uh, the CH this this uh, this portion of the CH2 forms an integral part of all practical fuels. And this is of interest because if we just consider this, uh, just the uh, reaction of the CH2 with a uh, this hypothetical reaction of the CH2 with oxygen, this oxidation, what we'll see is that the uh, heat release is huge, 156 kilocalorie per mole, and this is uh, kind of. Uh, you do not encounter this kind of very large heat release in any other uh, any other, other reactions in chemistry. So, this is this uh, large heat release in a small uh, uh, molecule and as a result small mass and small volume that is very high energy density once again this very high energy density of the hydrocarbon fuels is what makes them very attractive for air breathing uh, aerospace propulsion. Okay. So, uh, now uh, let us look into some of the typical fuels, you see that these are the typical fuels for example, this can be alkanes uh, C M H 2 M plus 2 where M can be anything from 1 to uh, many many large uh, number. Uh, of course, this is as you see this is N butane, this is a normal butane and straight chain alkanes. Uh, you can have this uh, trimethyl pentane where uh, methyl group can be attached to this second uh, carbon atom. Uh, these are the radicals: one butyl radical, two butyl radical, which will which will encounter uh, in different um, oxidation mechanisms. But not all alkanes are straight chain alkanes. You can have cycloalkanes, okay. And for example, this is a cyclopropane. This uh, this is the cyclic uh, structure which uh, makes gives this name is the cyclopropane. And you can have the cyclohexane, right? But uh, remember that uh, this is not this is this is different. Uh, this is not uh, benzene. Uh, because in benzene you have this uh, this uh, double bonds um, at alternate uh, uh, places, right? Uh, so, but the properties of uh, of course cyclo uh, alkahexane and uh, benzene are very different. Okay, and then you can have alkenes, uh, which is represented by this uh, double bond here, CMH two M, and then you can have two butene um, alkanes, alkynes essentially to involving triple bonds, uh, propyne. Um, uh, this kind of things and of course, you can have aromatics for which we are talking about that is a benzene which is gives this uh, the double bonds at alternate locations and this gives cyclic structures. Now, it we will soon realize that uh, aromatics even if you start with uh, simple molecules like uh, alkanes like this one uh, and butane uh, in under different uh, because of the complexity of the reactions different species will be formed different species different radicals even in some cases the aromatics will be formed and when we will go into soot chemistry uh, formation of soot you will see that these aromatics play a very important role in the soot chemistry. Okay. And then of course, uh, this uh, as we discuss as we just said that this uh, poly aromatic hydrocarbons or PAH. Uh, which is uh, in its condensed form is called naphthalene and its uncondensed form is essentially a biphenyl molecule. Mm, and this uh, uh, forms uh, important uh, are very important soot precursors that is before soot forms these things form and uh, uh, these forms an integral part of the soot reaction mechanisms. 
and of course we can have alcohols uh, as you know that uh, there is a lot of uh, interest in making methanol, uh, butanol, uh, uh, these things uh, ethanol uh, work in engines, uh, car engines and uh, they can also emerge as uh, useful fuels in for future uh, um, uh, aircrafts. So, but they have because of the large water content they are they have lower heat content but they, uh, they also produce lo lower soot. So, it is beneficial, they are less polluting. Now, uh, the core C is as you know, as we know it is combustion in air breathing aero engines. Now, what is the most important fuel used in aero engines? For example, in an aviation gas turbine engine, what does it use? It uses some variants of kerosene which is called aviation jet fuel or jet A, jet A, jet A1 known as slightly variation in uh, composition uh, and these names come from their use in different countries. So, what is jet A? Here you can see the composition of jet A. It is uh, as in contrary to what we just discussed of uh, normal alkanes, cycloalkanes, etc. It is not a single fuel, it is essentially a com combination of this different kind of uh, um, uh, alkanes, aromatics, etc. So, as you see here, uh, these uh, uh, jet A contains about 19 percent of aromatics that is benzene, uh, uh, phenol, etc. mainly benzene uh, type of uh, uh, species. But the rest is like isoparaffins, paraffins are but nothing but alkanes, iso is, is a position of the methyl radical where it is attached to a carbon atom, normal paraffins, normal alkanes, cycloalkanes, dicycloparaffin, tricycloparaffin. So, the rest 81 percent is nothing but alkanes. Okay. Now, of course, when you do a fundamental study or a CFD simulation, it is very difficult to use all these kinds of uh, different uh, species uh, even at the starting point. So, what we do is that we use something like a, um, a surrogate fuel um, which, is a, which is a representative fuel which represents the properties of jet A very well. So, how do you s get such a representative fuel? So, you find out this what are the composition of jet A and uh, you come up with an average formula of jet A which is given by C, this is a C 11.37 H 21.87 and the hydrogen to carbon ratio is 1.92. As you see the hydrogen content is 1.39 percent by mass, molecular weight is about 158.6 gram per mole and its density is less than water at 0 0.804 gram per milliliter. Okay. And as we said that depending on these things N dodecan that is C 12 H 24 is becomes a good choice for the surrogate fuel uh, for jet A. This is the typically the composition of fuels that you use in uh, aviation gas turbines. Okay. Now, why are we talking about this? We are talking about this uh, uh, for example, uh, we will just, uh, uh, we'll just discuss something here. Uh, now, uh, how do you characterize these fuel properties? Now, one important property of uh, fuels is basically what is its ignition delay. What is ignition delay? Now, suppose you take the fuel and air uh, uh, you take the fuel air mixture in a container in a closed container which is adiabatic okay. and of course, the say the fuel and air are mixed at a given feed and this container has a maintained at a temperature T and it contains fuel plus air. Now, of course, as you know that our general uh, common sense or intuition suggests that if this mixed fuel and air which is perfectly mixed, it is uh, it is homogeneously mixed and uh, if it is uh, um, if it is in a mixed state. Uh, it is in a perfectly mixed state and uh, now if the temperature and the uh, pressure is sufficiently high, you know that for reactions to happen the temperature and pressure needs to be sufficiently high, you know this thing will ignite. Okay. So, ignition means its temperature will rise. So, if we plot the temperature versus time, you will see that if this is my initial temperature, say this was my initial temperature T i and P i, then the temperature will rapidly rise. Uh, after some time. Now, we can say that the ignition delay time is the time basically the time it takes for the mixture 
to rise at a up to a specific temperature which can be like say uh, you define as like 400 Kelvin difference from the initial temperature to the uh, which we define as the ignition temperature. So, ignition delay is nothing but this time. Okay. So, this is one very important property of uh, that we need to characterize for fuels. All right. Now, why do we why are we talking about this? We are talking about this because you see you will see that even if the temperature and pressure is sufficiently high, suppose the initial temperature of you are taking say this uh, jet F fuel or its surrogate, suppose you are taking N dot A can and the initial temperature and pressure is about the initial temperature is about 800 Kelvin. Okay. Now, we are uh, considering say dot A can and it is T i is equal to say 800 Kelvin and its initial pressure is say 20 atmosphere. It is a relevant temperature for gas turbine engine. right? So, uh, how long does the fuel air mixture take to ignite? Of course, this is dodecan plus air. So, then we can what we can do is that once again we can do this do this kind of an experiment and we can find out the uh, how much the temperature rises. This can be done in a shock tube or a homogeneous reactor or, 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 or in a um, uh, uh, any kind of uh, this kind of flow reactors. Uh, okay. um, so, uh, and we find out the ignition delay time and then we can vary the initial time, initial uh, temperature and we can find out a correlation by which as a function of the initial temperature that is how much does the ignition delay time is as you change the temperature. And when you get this you can form a correlation like this that you, your ignition delay time will can depend on pressure, it can depend on the mass mole fraction of oxygen, it can depend on the carbon number etcetera. Okay. So, this is an, uh, L, an alkan ignition deal. I am not uh, going into the details of this, but we one can find uh, find different kinds of uh, correlation okay. and the data will actually look something like this. Okay. This is T ignition delay in milliseconds and this is 1000 divided by temperature. So, what we have done is that we have done this experiment uh, in a in a in a, uh, in a where we took the fuel air mixture in a perfectly mixed state and then we varied the initial temperature. Okay. Now, as we vary the initial temperature the ignition delay time changes. Okay. For example, here you see the initial state of the mixture was phi equal 1.0 and pressure is equal to 20 atmosphere. And you see that if we start what this this plot tells is that if we start at a say this value of 1 which is means 1000 by T is equal to 1 which means T is equal to 1000 Kelvin. So, the ignition delay time at this point is about 1 milliseconds. Okay. If we increase temperature all right uh, that is uh, uh, if we uh, increase temperature to about uh, uh, to about uh, 1000 uh, uh, about uh, if it was uh, 2000 Kelvin uh, then it will have shifted here. So, when we increase if uh, T increases um, in this direction. So, uh, as you see T when it T increases it uh, the ignition delay actually goes down, but here is something complicated happening it is actually the ignition delay is uh, instead of uh, it, it as you in, as you decrease the temperature now here it actually goes down which is very counterintuitive, but we will go into this later. But what I want to say is that that uh, even at a temperature as high as uh, 1000 Kelvin uh, or if it is less than 1000 Kelvin if it is at say this value uh, when 1000 by T is equal to 1.2 uh, the ignition delay time is a finite number of about 1 millisecond. Okay. So, this is a typical number of ignition delay time of 1 milliseconds. All right. Now, why are we discussing all these things? The reason is that this ignition delay time of 1 millisecond is the time required for this fuel air mixture to ignite. Okay. So, you must you have to design a combustor in which your flow residence time scales is must be greater than 1 millisecond. Okay. So, that is why these things are important and then if you want to predict the behavior the actual behavior in of, of combustion happening inside a practical combustor you have to capture this ignition delay time properly. And this ignition delay time this proper capturing of the ignition delay time can be only done 
when you have a detailed reaction mechanism. When you from a given fuel you can break it up when the fuel breaks up and it becomes small and small molecules it, uh, it becomes the product through a series of steps. These sort of finite ignition delay times cannot be predicted by global chemistry. So, to predict these kinds of very specific and very important properties like the ignition delay time accurately you need uh, you need uh, you need detailed uh, chemistry. Now, under what circumstances do you have to bother about this kind of ignition delay time in terms of a practical engine. Let us consider a uh, let us consider two cases like say two combustor one is say a gas turbine combustor ok. Here say you have uh, solars etcetera and flow coming in. Say the flow velocity inside is about the average velocity is 100 meters per second ok. This is say um, how much less than much less than 1 meter say 0.5 meter length of the combustor. This is the uh, gas turb engine combustor ok. So, here the fuel air mixture is coming at a velocity of 100 meters per second and the length of the combustor is 0.5 meter ok. Now, of course, there are many complexities as you know that it is basically in a gas turbine engine we inject the fuel in liquid form. So, the it is injected in a spray form. So, the spray must uh, uh, atomize it must uh, it the spray must break up it must atomize it must evaporate mix uh, and then combust, but let us not go into these things ok. So, just by this two information that is average velocity is about 100 meters per second and the length of the gas turbine combustor is 0.5 meter we can find out the tau residence time scale tau s as the length of the combustor divided by the flow velocity. So, then it gives as is basically half a meter times 100 uh, meters per second. So, this gives you essentially a time of 1 by 200 seconds which is nothing but 1000 by 200 milliseconds. Okay. So, it is about 5 milliseconds. This is 1 meter, this was meter a second, yes. So, the time scale available is about 5 milliseconds, but as you see, it is not hugely different from what the ignition delay time of jet A was ok. So, you have to ensure you have to ensure that that the fuel whereas, ignition delay time as we discussed is a time for the homogeneous mixture to go from uh, initial state of T i to the product state ok to ignition to, to at least ignition to a sufficient level. So, you have to design combustors in such a way so that you can have complete combustion and less pollutant emission ok. Now, if you are doing a CFD calculation of this gas turbine combustor you then it clearly says that to resolve the ignition delay time of about 1 milliseconds you need to produce you need to put in all the detailed reaction mechanisms by which the fuel will go from the large fuel molecule of dodecane to it will break down into smaller and smaller pieces of fuel it will become methane, ethylene, ethane, propane, butane etcetera and all these things and then it will oxidize through different uh, reaction mechanisms there will be chain branching there will be chain carry initiation mechanisms there will be chain carrying mechanisms there will be chain branching reactions and then it will go to uh, complete combustion. So, to understand this thing and to resolve these kinds of ignition delay to resolve this to arrive at this 1 millisecond you need detailed chemistry ok. 
By detailed chemistry what I mean is that you need all these detailed steps and detailed this numerous uh, species by which this can be uh, pr uh, predicted. This situation is even more complex in a scramjet combustor. Okay. Let us consider a scramjet combustor where the flow velocity is about 1000 meters per second and this is about say 1 meter. Okay. Now, here your temperature is say about 800 Kelvin and your pressure is about 1 atmosphere or 0.5 atmosphere something like that. So, once again we can estimate the residence time scales which is nothing but the length by the average velocity and that comes out to be like 1 by 1000 seconds is equal to 1 millisecond. Okay. So, in this scramjet combustor you see the residence time is equal to the ignition delay time. Of course, this is at high larger pressure, but still this is 1 millisecond. right? So, when you are suppose you are doing a simulation of a scramjet combustor for design purposes or for other validation purposes of your uh, scramjet uh, combustor code. So, the thing is that you cannot design it properly, you cannot arrive at proper validation until and unless you have uh, until and unless you have enough reactions in your calculation which can predict this ignition delay time of 1 milliseconds. And then after you do that you have to do engineering and that is why CFD calculations are important. You have to do engineering so that you can have a stable combustion. If you do not do anything you see that you cannot have uh, you cannot have uh, stable combustion because this fuel and air packet is reaching here at 1000 meters per second. So, by the time ignition starts it will all it will already reach the end of the combustor right. In 1 milliseconds it will travel this distance and that is the time it takes for it to ignite. So, it will go out in the outside out of the combustor and then it will get mixed with the outside air and there will be no uh, combustion and then there will be no thrust and no power generation. So, to properly design the scramjet combustor you see you really need to have detailed reaction mechanisms. Okay. So, that is the importance of reaction mechanisms which is clearly understood from a comparison of a residence time and the ignition delay time. Of course, here we compared very simplified quantities it is just a back of the envelope calculation. Your residence time scale is a very crude measure here and so is the ignition delay time scale because the process is much more complex. The most important thing is that it is not in a homogeneous state even though it can start from a homogeneous state the combustion does not happen in a homogeneous state. You will see that flames differ from this kind of things because in flames you will have diffusion, you have uh, heat conduction and you will have viscous effects. So, uh, this thing is in a, the, in, a, in a actual engine things are more complex. Uh, nevertheless, this gives a clear idea about uh, that the competition between your flow time scales and the ignition delay time scales. Time scales okay. And to resolve this thing properly your CFD uh, codes must have some amount of details of the reaction mechanism. Now, when we mean some amount of details what are we actually meaning? What details are we putting in? Okay. What are the steps that is required to pre predict this kinds of ignition delay? What is why 1 millisecond time is required? Why do you see this anti this uh, dip in the ignition delay behavior etcetera? So, to study those we will go into uh, the details of the uh, reaction mechanisms.